I didn't know that much about me. <laughs> Thank you for your kind words. You might want to open your Bibles, 1 Corinthians, first chapter. We're going to work from there this morning. Let me express my appreciation to the eldership for overseeing the school of preaching and for allowing me to be one of the faculty members to serve and to teach along the side of many, many great men. I'm humbled by that, and I appreciate much the school and the opportunity to speak this morning on the assigned topic, Cultures Clash, the Power of God versus the Wisdom of Men. If you'll check in the book, and I want you to read it now, but tonight after you go home, after the exegesis of 1 Corinthians 1, 17 through 31, I have an appendage dealing with explaining and setting forth the biblical worldview. Really, the section that I'm going to deal with does that. God has a biblical worldview. It is superior to any, to all worldviews of mankind. It was a worldview that began in the Garden of Eden, set forth in chapter 2, progressively worked through the centuries in the patriarchal dispensation, the mosaic dispensation, and cultivating in God's ultimatum Christianity. And as such, it will clash with the culture in which it exists. Christianity is no friend to atheism, nor agnosticism, nor neo-orthodoxy. Christianity is superior, answers, and shows the foolishness of all the world views, and there are many of them, of mankind. Our text, 1 Corinthians 1, beginning in verse 17, down through verse 31, deals with the cultures of the world and the clash between Christianity and the wisdom of men. It breaks into two sections. Verse 17 is a divine argument. Verse 18 through 31 is a divine commentary on the argument. Paul says in verse 17, For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ be made of none effect. Let's ferret some truth out out of this passage. Let's understand the divine argument. Let's understand what Christianity is saying. Let's understand how God culminates his thinking for humanity in Christianity. The verse has some negatives and positives in it. Paul said, Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. This references back to verses 11 through verses 16 in this chapter. A controversy arose in the city of Corinth and in the church there, focusing on the personal loyalty of who baptized the individual Christians. At one point, Paul asked, or says, that some claim that they were of Apollos, or they were of Peter, or they were of Paul. And Paul had no desire to add to their division. They already existed, and he was trying to resolve them. The words, Christ sent me not to baptize, may not be used by anyone 
to minimize preaching and practicing baptism. As baptism is forever a part of the Great Commission and a part of Christianity. We can't separate baptism out of Christianity, and Paul was not saying that. In verses 14 and verse 16, he enumerates some whom he had baptized, men like Gaius and Crispus and Stephanus. But lest someone should say, verse 15, I had baptized in my own name, he had others baptized for him. His desire to minimize the faith, or he had no desire, rather, to minimize the faith, nor to take away the reverence due to Christ, our Savior, and as a consequence, cause division. There's a thing that Ferguson says in his great tome on baptism that's important here. And it's a thing that I think all of us need to grasp. I'm not saying let's forget who baptized us as individuals. I well remember. I remember the night. I remember the day. I remember the date. I remember the place. I remember the man that baptized me into Christ. But Ferguson rightly states, and this is what the text is arguing, Christ is the essential referent in baptism. And so when those said, I am of Christ, I think they were right. I think they were saying, look, I'm baptized, but I'm in Christ. The person who did the teaching, Ferguson says, or who administered the act of baptism is not the referent. Baptism in the name of Christ was the expected result from preaching gospel. Now Paul says the gospel was not to be preached with the wisdom of words. Now that does not mean they were not to use good grammar, proper grammar. That does not mean that we're not to use syntax, that we're not to use logic, and that we're not to be clear or show clarity in our message. We are. But it does mean that man's wisdom has not the ability to save man. Here's why. Man's wisdom lacks the event. The cross is of the wisdom of God. That's the event. Man's wisdom lacks the substance to explain the cross. That's the gospel, the message which we are to proclaim. Paul uses interchangeably preaching the word and preaching the cross of Christ. In fact, he even goes so far in verse 2 of the next chapter. He said, I determined to know nothing among you except Christ and him crucified. I preach to you a crucified Christ, and the substance of that is in the gospel message. He says, I don't want to preach with the wisdom of men for this reason, less the cross of Christ, less the event and less the message that explains that event is of none effect. Now the word none effect simply means empty. It means vain. And I like what Brother Hugo McCord translates, or how he translates. He said it means becoming meaningless. If I preach the gospel of Christ from man's wisdom, and not preach it from God's wisdom, the event and the substance 
then it is meaningless. It is powerless in redeeming man. Paul taught, and the reason that he could speak with such power and such clarity, he said, the words which I speak are the words which the Holy Spirit have taught me in 1 Corinthians 2 and verse 13. And this part is important in our proclaiming the gospel of Christ. But he has a positive here. He said, Christ sent me to preach the cross. That's what he sent me to do. And I think that you can go to Paul's lesson to King Agrippa in Acts 26. And beginning there in verse 18 and 19, and you can get Paul's commission. He said, I'm to open their eyes and turn them from darkness to light, from the power of Satan to God, that or for this reason, they may receive the forgiveness of sins and the inheritance of the saints among them which are sanctified by faith that's in me. Whereupon, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision. Let's spare it for a moment. I was sent to open their eyes in the message of my preaching of the event. I am to convict men of sin, create guilt in their hearts, Number two, I am to turn them from darkness to light, turn them from sin unto righteousness. Number three, turn them from the power of Satan as a control and lord of their life to the power of God, God's sovereignty. When I can turn them, when I can make them feel guilty, I can turn them from darkness to light. I can, with a divine message, turn them from the power of Satan to the power of God. And that living and active word in their heart will give them remission of sins or forgiveness, which only come by the act of baptism. He didn't say baptism is not essential. It's implied in his commission from Christ. And at the same time, give him hope in a world of despair. They have an inheritance after they leave this life. And then he just simply says, that was the commission I received from Christ and I was not disobedient to it. So in this statement of Paul, that I am to preach the gospel, you have the substance, that message, and you have the event being expressed. And that's what Paul says later in the Corinthian epistle in 1 Corinthians 15. He said, for I delivered first of all that which I have received, a message, a substance. How that Christ died for our sins, an event. According to the scriptures according to divine authority. And that he was buried, and he rose again the third day, and a van of resurrection, according to the scriptures, divine authority. If, if a gospel preacher, if a Christian minimizes and nullifies the event, the cross, 
he minimizes and nullifies, Paul says, the substance, the gospel. If the Christian minimizes and nullifies the substance, the gospel, he minimizes and it nullifies the power of preaching Christ. They're inseparable. They stand and they fall together. And this is the culmination of the biblical worldview that began in Genesis 2, that was prophesied in Genesis 3.15, now culminated in Christ and him crucified. Let's look at the divine commentary. Verse 18 says, For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved it is the power of God. The word for connects verse 18 with what has been said in the divine argument. And it says that the preaching of the cross always produces results. always produces results. There may be a negative result, he says. The preaching of the cross to them that perish, that is, it implies, to those that reject it, they're going to perish, and it's foolishness to them. But it has a positive effect. To those who accept it, they're saved. The word saved is interesting. It was a secular word of the time of Christ and Paul that talked about one's health. One's health was either good or bad. And the Holy Spirit picks that word up and brings it over in to deal with your soul and my soul. And when we have been united to Christ through the preaching of the cross, the message and the event, then our spiritual health is well. And salvation is a result of taking the prescription of the plan of salvation and the Christian life. Groshide writes, he said the work of Christ demonstrates that the wisdom of the world is not wisdom at all because it doesn't reckon with God and neither does the wisdom of the world or the wisdom of men accomplish anything. He right. Worldly wisdom is earthly and devilish and sensual and divisive. But James also says in 3 and 17, the wisdom of God, which is from above, is pure. It is a purifying message. And that's what the biblical worldview culminates in in Christianity. In 22, or 19, well, I guess 20 I need to go to. 19, I don't want to lose my spot. For it's written, I'll destroy the wisdom of the wise. I'll bring nothing to the understanding of the prudent. To establish the world view that saves man, Paul appeals to Isaiah. And he has a reference here to Assyria ready to invade Israel. And the advisors to the king came giving their wisdom and their prudence and their ideas how to survive. And God said, listen, salvation is on my terms, not man." And he describes it this way. God destroyed the wisdom of the wise. 
to bring to not to nothing the understanding of the prudent. And God's wisdom in dealing with salvation and redeeming man and giving us a life that has a hope and the fruit of heaven destroys the wisdom of men. It destroys or brings to nothing the understanding of the prudent. In verse 20, he has four questions. Where's the wise? Where's the scribe? Where is the disputer of the world? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? The last one is affirmative. The other three imply negatives. Where's the wise? There's no one wise enough to know how to devise, conceive, or conceive, and to put into plan redemption. Where's the scribe? I think it applies first to the Jewish scribes who were skilled in the law. And yet, when Christ came, didn't understand that he was the fulfillment of the law. And I think it applies to the Gentile philosophers who failed to understand God's way. Back in the book of Isaiah, Isaiah or God has Isaiah saying, look, my thoughts are not your thoughts. My ways are not your ways. My thoughts are higher than your thoughts and higher than your ways. And then he, he concludes that thought in Isaiah with this. So shall my word go forth out of my mouth and not return to me void. It shows you the power, the efficacy, and the success of the biblical worldview that is now culminated in Christianity. Where's the disputer of the world? The Jews had the Old Testament scriptures. They read, they studied them, the scribes taught them, they were the experts of the time when Christ came and they rejected him. Likewise, the Gentile wise men, when Paul goes to Athens and Paul preaches Christ and the existence of God and the resurrection, they said, we want to hear something new. Acts 17, 21. But the biblical worldview, beginning in Genesis 2, culminating in Christianity has been here from creation. Then he said, has not God made the foolishness or foolish the wisdom of the world? And it's yes, he has. And I like what Linsky said. Linsky said, man merely thought what he had was wisdom and when God touched it, when God touched man's wisdom, its true character of folly, of foolishness, became evident. Sometimes we think we're so wise in dealing with spiritual things. But God has the answer. He has the answer in the biblical worldview. In verse 21, he uses the preaching of the cross to draw men to himself. Jesus said that, and if I be lifted up, I draw all men unto myself, John 12, 32. And in 33 explains, John does, that Jesus was speaking of the cross, of his death. So the preaching of the cross, let me suggest to you, 
that we need to understand there are five facts involved. There's the death of Christ. That's the crucifixion. There's the burial of Christ. There's the resurrection that attests that he's the son of God with power. There's his ascension. And the coronation as king of kings and lord of lords. And as Paul says, the only potentate, 1 Timothy 6, 15. Grosheid again says the work of Christ demonstrates that the wisdom of the world is not wisdom at all because it does not reckon with God and neither does it accomplish anything. So 22 through 24, he reemphasizes and demonstrates that the wisdom of men is not only wrong but ineffective. For the Jews require a sign, the Greeks seek after wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified under the Jews a stumbling block, and under the Greeks foolishness. But unto them which are called, both Jew and Greeks, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. Let's look at it. Paul says of the Jews, reject the event, the cross. Reject the substance, the gospel, the message that explains why the cross. And to the Jew, it was a stumbling block. Linsky says it's a death trap. That's right. For when one rejects the cross, the event, and when we reject the substance, the message, the gospel of Christ, Paul says in Hebrews, there remains no more sacrifice for sins. Hebrews 10, 26. No wonder it was a death trap to them. It's that simple. But the cross of Christ to the Greeks was considered foolishness. Now, let me deal a little bit with Greek philosophy and how they reasoned about things, and then we begin to understand why the Greeks looked at God's wisdom as a, mor as a moron. They looked at it as moronic, foolishness. That's the word for foolish here is is moron, moronic. The Greek philosophy reason that God had a total inability to feel. I want you to grasp that. They reason that if God can have feeling of love, and he does, John 3, 16, 1 John 4, 9 and 10, Romans 5, 8 and 9, if he can have the feeling of joy and he does. Luke 15, look at his rejoicing when the angels, or when one comes back to him. If he can have compassion, and he does, and if he can have these feelings just as man has them, then someone or something greater influenced God. And consequently, that something or someone is greater than God. That's what's behind the idea that the Greeks looked at the crucifixion of Christ and said it's foolishness. You say the cross is a demonstration of God's love for man? That's love, that feeling? It can be. That's moronic. You say that God's got compassion on the downtrodden, the broken-hearted, the guilt-burdened, 
that he would give his only begotten son to die? That's foolishness. And so when you preach the cross to them, their wisdom said, that's foolishness. The Greek demands of the wisdom of men leaves no place for God's wisdom. Lightfoot says this of this text. He said the Jews pursue the shadow of the Old Testament. They always looked for the Messiah. They looked at the type and they rejected it. And then Lightfoot says, the Greeks, in substituting man's wisdom, substituted that which was counterfeit. Man's wisdom is counterfeit to God's wisdom. 25 through 29. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men, for you see that you're calling, brethren, how that not many wise after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called, but God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty, and the base things of the world and the things which are despised God hath chosen, and yea, the things which are not, to bring to naught the things which are. Look at that and think about it. He just argues in verse 25 that if you want to take the foolishness of God, which the Greeks attributed to him, and if you want to take the weakness of God that they attribute to him, they're even, he's stronger than man. But then in 26, he comes to Corinth and he goes to the church and he deals with a cultural thing. He deals with a culture construction or composition, rather, of the church at Corinth. He said, look among you. There are not many wise. There are not many mighty. There are not many noble that are called. Have you ever sat down and tried to figure out the composition of the church at Corinth. Well, we know that Crispus and Sothenes and Acts 18 had been rulers of the synagogue. We know in Romans 16, 25, that Erastus was the treasurer of the city of Corinth. He didn't say there weren't any wives. He didn't say there weren't any mighty. He didn't say there weren't any noble that were called. He said there were not many. He's right. These men heard and these men obeyed. And I think that this section sets forth with clarity the contrast of this biblical worldview that we need to realize in our clash with a worldview. I like what Bede in his commentary observes at this point about the wise, the noble, and the mighty. He said intellect and education and rank, which he means success and wealth, are so precious when laid on the altar of the Lord. They are. We need men of intellect that can confound the atheist and the agnostic. We need men that are educated. None of us can ever get enough. We need men of success to help support and endow and help Proclaim the gospel of Christ and advance it in a world. And we need men of wealth that will lay that on God's order for the success of Christianity. But here's what he says. 
it is precious when laid on the altar of God, implied with those distinctions. Yet, by promising to supply themselves our needs, they tend to keep men from obeying the gospel. And so, we can be intelligent, and we must be. We can be educated, and we must be. We can be successful in life, and we must be. And we can be wealthy in life, and we must be. But they do not supply us what God's wisdom does, salvation. We can use that to advance the cause of Christ. And so must we. In this section, I think the biblical worldview is considered nothing by the secular worldview. In 29 through 31, the end that I need to move on. In 29, he said, as he is speaking above, the reason he said it was that no flesh should glory in Christ, in his presence, rather. Salvation's not a man. And if salvation was a man, then man could boast. Look at 1 Corinthians, the third chapter, and verse 19. For the wisdom of the world is foolishness with God, for it's written, He hath taken the wise in their own craftiness. And again, the Lord knoweth the thoughts of the wise, they're vain. And so we have no reason to boast in our wisdom. But in 30, Paul said, But of him are ye in Christ, or Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom. And then he gives three nouns that I think describes God's wisdom to mankind. He said it's righteousness. Righteousness is simply being right with God. Living as God wants us to live. Living a biblical worldview. Being faithful. Being Christians. That's what God's wisdom, it brings us how to live as we are. Secondly, he said sanctification. How we can live lives that are holy lives. Be you holy as I'm holy, 1 Peter 1, verse 16. In Romans, the first chapter, Paul said, I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God, present your bodies living sacrifices holy. Now catch it. Acceptable to God. which is your reasonable service. A good translation of what your reasonable service is this. Do what God's expected of you. And then he says redemption. God's wisdom produces salvation for man. It does that which man's wisdom cannot do. We have redemption in Christ Jesus, Ephesians 1 7. He is our Savior, Matthew 1. There is no salvation in any other name but His, Acts 4 12. So let us draw near to God with pure hearts, Hebrews 10. And then in 31, that according as it is written, he that glory, let him glory in the Lord. I want to go back to the Old Testament and then one New Testament passage in the lesson's years. Jeremiah 9, 23 and 4 say, Let not the wise man glory in his wisdom, neither let the mighty man glory in his might. Let not the rich man glory in his riches. 
But let him that glorieth glory in this, that he understand and know me, that I am the Lord, who exercises loving kindness and judgment and righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight, saith the Lord. And then I think of that great passage at the conclusion of the book of Galatians 6 and 14. But God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. I thank you.